I'd like to ask you this morning to turn your Bibles to the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. We're about two-thirds of the way through the teaching of the book of Revelation. I guess probably at some point we might take a little time to ask you if you have any questions. Maybe probably the better way is if you ever have any question or something you need answered as we're going through this. I try to go very carefully as I go and I try to turn up every rock that has a little nugget of knowledge under it. But this is the divine revelation of God to the church. God revealed his plan and his determination to the old prophet Daniel. He also talked to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah. He, he told these old prophets the way it would be. But then he sealed it up. And it was for no man to see nor to understand. Because they desired to look into the mystery of God and see God's plan. But God never let them see it. He kept it closed until the church came. The time of grace which no prophet was ever able to see. And the church was born on the day of Pentecost and the time of grace was given from God. As God made, as Brother Ernie said, uh, made everything, it repented him that he had made it and he destroyed it. But he gave grace unto Noah and there was eight souls saved. Another time he came down and, and showed his regret of what had taken place and he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because the world had become so ungodly and perverted just like it is today. I've heard some preachers say if God did that to Sodom and Gomorrah he'll have to repent over what we are today if he doesn't do something but he's going to do something. Amen. You see God has promised. God promised all of his blessings upon his family the, the wife that he chose, the house of Israel, whenever God was grieved at the sinfulness of man, he chose Father Abraham to be the father of all of his plan. God chose Abraham and he promised to bless him and multiply his seed like the sand of the seas. God has done that. We know that when Jesus Christ was crucified, and this coming week will be a special time for all of us, you know, we kind of commemorate the crucifixion on Friday. It actually happened on Thursday. But uh, there was three days that he laid in the grave, and then next Easter Sunday morning will be the celebration of the resurrection. We stand this morning very unworthy, but we stand this morning strong in the fundamentals of God's plan. The very death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the reason why we can be here this morning. Jesus is the reason for every ounce of your hope. And I'm going to say something before I get started into the teaching. If you're putting off your relationship with God, I beg you to not do it any longer. This thing is closer than you understand. The coming of the Lord is at hand. The rapture of the church is the next thing to take place, and it will take place. This church is leaving. You know, uh, Brother Ernie, you were talking about a while ago that God had given you this thought about him being our shepherd. And I thought as you were talking about that, my grandmother was 86 years old. She was blind for probably over half of her life. She had hair that touched the ground. She had never taken a pair of scissors to her hair. Us children always wanted to go in there and brush her hair because you had to brush a long way to brush grandma's hair. And your brush was on the ground before you got through it. But she lived her life to glorify God. She couldn't see things like we see. She was blind. But she saw the glory of God. She knew the glory of God. And when she was dying, she asked my grandfather if he would get the old Bible out and read to her the 23rd Psalm. And uh, there was not enough time. 
but my mother, she quoted it to Grandma, how that the Lord was her shepherd. And whenever she had finished, she looked over at Grandpa, turned her little head towards Grandpa and said, Honey, I believe every word of it. Amen. And went to sleep. Be a good way to leave here, wouldn't it? Yes. This morning, we are here to celebrate the death burial of Jesus Christ. But the resurrection this coming Sunday will be a glorious time for the church. It always is. This morning we want to teach you about the revelation that God gave John. The, the mystery of God is not a mystery anymore. God has revealed it through John to the church. This thing that was hidden from all the prophets, this time of grace that we enjoy right now, it's a very special time. It is a pause in everything that God planned so that he could love the Gentile people. This is a time of salvation. This is a time of love and mercy to the whole world. And it doesn't make any difference how wicked you've been, how far away from God you've walked, what all the bad things you've done in your life. Jesus came and died for you. The very plan of God included you. But as we get to where we are today, prophetically speaking, and teaching the book of Revelation as it will be, and trying to show you the plan of God, we know that in the book of Daniel, and I've referred you to it many times, you can read about the things that God determined upon his people before the end would come. And we've said, and we want you to understand when we say the end, it's not the end of eternity. It's not the end of time. God will never end, nor will his people ever end. God made all that we look on and see as a temporary blessing to those that he loved. But man was created of God in his own image. We were created like him. We were created eternal. He breathed into our uh, lungs the breath of life. He gave us eternal life. We're not like an animal that falls by the wayside and is dead. We are eternal. We will live forever. And there are two places that you will live. You will either choose to not love God and you will go to hell forever. And uh, the other choice is to choose God and to live forever in the place that he has gone to prepare for us. Now we want you to understand that when we get to this place this morning where we are going to start teaching in the book of the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation that Jesus has been revealed to John. He is not a savior. He is not humble. He is a great high priest that will rule and reign. And then we see the time of the church and the messages that we gave to the church and we were very careful how that we taught those seven messages to the seven churches. But the church is gone. At this time in teaching, in this time of God's revelation, the church has already been translated to heaven. We're around the throne of God. We've been introduced to God, to the heavenly host. God has given the book to Jesus for his final plan that we call the end. Nothing will ever end with God and his people. Nothing will ever end with God and his creation, although many of them chose to hate him. This thing will never end for the devil and God. But the battle that exists now between the devil and God at this point in teaching has finished. Now we still have the revelation of the greatest judgments of all and that is the vile judgments. We have just been told how that the war went on in heaven but God assured Israel that he was still God, his plan was still working and that he would take care of them and we talked about how that when Israel brought forth God's son Jesus God protected her, and God will protect her during this time. Jesus told the house of Israel, told his disciples, they shared the message, 
when you see all these things come to pass. He said it will be a time of tribulation that has never been seen in the time of history nor ever shall be again. But he said don't go to gather anything but run, hide because this time and this thing is for the house of Israel. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. He said the abomination of desolation will take place. That's when the devil will reveal himself and remove the worship of God from the face of the earth. The war is already went in. When we get to this place, the war has already been finished in heaven between Michael, whom God, the highest angel, he gave the, the responsibility for the house of Israel to care for her and for the church. The church is in heaven. The church is with God. The house of Israel has, is, is being persecuted beyond measure. This is a time of Jacob's trouble as we've studied the book of Revelation. Everything that has taken place in this final week has to do with Israel. The time of the Gentiles is over. The war has gone on in heaven and Michael has cast the devil from the presence of God forever. He cast him to the earth. He can no more go into the heavenlies and accuse the brethren before God. God shut him up. God finished him. God whipped him. God told Michael, cast him out and cast him to the earth that I'm going to destroy and let him do whatever he's going to do to finish it because it is over. The battle has already been won. As we teach here and we get to this place, we, the last thing that we revealed unto you was that this beast rose up out of the sea of humanity and he has become the dictator of the world, the ruler of the world. And this false prophet that was raised up that came out of the false churches that will be left behind when the rapture takes place you know, we have the World Council of Churches and we have the, 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 the big organizations that control the, control the religious world and we have the Catholicism that so many follow. But let me tell you something, there is no religion that's ever going to hold up when Jesus finishes his work. The church will not suffer the wrath of God. I keep teaching this and I know that there are a lot of my good brothers that really love God, but they don't teach this the way I do because I see this not as a time of great revival. I see the final week of God's prophecy as a time, just like Jesus stated, it would be a time of great tribulation. It would be a time this beast rises up and he rules the world. This false pri priest a false prophet raises up and he gives all of his power to the first beast. These nations that are united and these heads that have raised up on this serpent, all the plagues of all the judgments that God has already given, they're all over the earth. Fire is falling. Everything is burning up. The sea's turning into blood. A third of the seas, a third of all the living in the ocean has died. There are demons running up and down the streets of the world stinging everybody that they can find. There are over 200 million of them as God's word teaches that are on the earth at this time. When we come down to this point where we are today, we shared a little bit of this chapter with you last week about those that were preserved of God during this time. And that is of the house of Israel. It's a time for Israel. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. It's the final week of the prophecy that God said to Daniel, I have determined 70 weeks till this thing is over, till my plan is finished, and I will finish it all, and then God will start eternity with the coronation of his son, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the house of Israel will never be fought against again. There'll never be another soul suffer a sinful deed. There'll never be any more crying. There'll never be any more suffering at the hands of the devil because God has already destroyed his work. God is finished with the devil. When we get here to the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, the demand has been gone out from this political figure to receive this mark 
And if you received it, and the Bible says that all will receive it, we understand that all that want to survive during this final three and a half weeks of the uh, three and a half years of the final week, a sabbatical week is what will take place, seven years, not 7,000 years, not a big long time, it's going to be seven years. And the devil knows that his time is short, he's been cast out of God's presence to the earth, and he's down here to destroy everyone that lives and breathes. He's after everybody. He even destroys the false prophet here in just about another chapter or two and he will destroy himself. God will let him punish and destroy everything that's left on the earth. On this thing, that uh, at the end of the 13th chapter, we've seen where that it was demanded that every man receive a mark, the mark of a man, 666, the mark of the beast. There is an image set up before him that becomes alive and it has a power and I've said I believe that this is the digital system and this is the cyber system they'll nothing hide from this beast there'll be no way to get a morsel of food without uh, during this time the favor of the beast everybody will have to worship him or they will die there is no more mercy. There is no more government. He owns the government. The devil controls the earth. When we get to this point, and the mark of the beast has been required, then we start into the things, these visions that God showed John. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And God, we thank you for understanding. And God, we're thankful that you don't ever leave us in darkness. God, you always give us the light of your desires and your message to mankind. God, we're thankful that you have not appointed us unto wrath. Lord, that the church will not go there through this time. We will not be here. We will already be in heaven. But Lord, we know that the battle between God and the devil, good and evil, has been finished. And Lord John is able to see the vision of the things that are going to take place during these last three and a half years of everything to come to a climax. Lord, everything is being prepared for the coronation of the kingdom of kings. Lord, the battle of evil and good is over and everything that John sees here in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation are things that's going to be taking place while the saints are in heaven and the devil's finishing his work on earth. God, help us to have understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. In the 14th chapter it says, And I looked, and, I, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sinai, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand. We said last week that these are the same hundred and forty-four thousand, twelve thousand from each tribe of Israel. Twelve times twelve, a hundred and forty-four thousand. These are the ones that God sealed there in the 6th chapter of the book of Revelation when he sealed these 144,000 he had these angels to hold the four corners of the earth till he came down and he sealed these 144,000 these are the same 144,000 that have went through these judgments that have went through these terrible times that God has sent upon the earth in judgment but they are standing here today with the Lamb. This is a forelooking, a looking forward to the time when the one that's riding on the cloud here will stand his feet upon Mount Zion. Thousands of years ago, the old prophet said that the Lamb would stand upon Mount Zion. He would stand there on the holy mountain with his people. This is the time looking forward now we all understand that it's just a few more chapters and we're going to see the revelation of the King of Kings coming with a vesture dipped in blood. 
He's going to come with power. The very word of his mouth is going to be enough to destroy everything that's left on the earth to be destroyed. He is the king of kings. When he came the first time, he came as a savior. When he comes the next time, he'll come as a king. He'll rule everything in God's dominion. There'll be no more sinfulness. There'll be no more resistance to God. The work of the devil will be finished. Now as we get ready to study this chapter of the 14th, we're getting ready, we're going to see visions that God showed John that would take place. Heaven is, I would say, on fire with all that God is doing. I'm not talking about a literal fire. I'm talking about activity. The angels are going at God's command. They're coming out of the temple. They're coming from the altar. They're coming to finish what God has said. They're announcing what God has already determined upon the earth. We see the 144,000. Let's just read a little bit together. They're standing with him. He said, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. There's a celebration in heaven going on but there's not a celebration on earth. You see there is a celebration looking forward to what God is going to do with the house of Israel. These will be those that will follow Jesus throughout the millennial kingdom when the Lord will walk upon earth and there will be peace like God intended from the very beginning. I know there are some preachers that have preached there won't be a millennial kingdom, but I don't know how they can read God's word and ever deny what God told all the old prophets and what we are being shown here in the book of Revelation. There is a time when Jesus will stand upon Mount Zion with his people. And there is a time when he will sit upon the throne of David like he promised he would. He will. God cannot lie. God cannot fail. And this will take place. At this point as we study, the earth is the devil's last work. He's out after every Gentile. He's out after the house of Israel. He's killing everything he looks at. He is at battle with himself. He's destroying anything. Even those that hate God. Even those that wouldn't repent. Those that denied God. Those that took the mark of the beast in their forehead or their hands. They're here and he's after them. There is no mercy from this devil that rules the earth at this point. As we're studying here, we see a time of victory and he shows this to the house of Israel because it's important for them to know that through all of this, God has not failed. God still has kept his people. And let me tell you, church, we're going to be rejoicing in heaven when all of this has taken place. Amen. It says here, as the harpers were harping on the harps, these 144,000, they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000. This is a special song. It's not a song for the Gentiles. It's a song for the house of Israel. It's a song for the family of Moses. It's a song for the 144,000, the 12 tribes, the wife of God. This is a message to God's wife. This is a message to the house of Israel. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among man, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These are the ones that our Lord came down and sealed and said, Devil, in all of this tribulation that's going to take place, and all of the ugly, uh, evil things that the devil's going to do to his own, he'll never be able to touch one of these. And God has fulfilled that. It said, and in their mouth 
was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now the heavens are open, the heavens are rejoicing, they're looking down upon the earth, the 144,000 prophetically are standing with Christ, it hasn't taken place yet, but John was able to see it. They will stand with him. You see, when the Lord comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords, he will come back to his people and he will rule and reign his kingdom from the throne of David like he promised that he would. It says there are six angels you're going to see in the next few verses that fly through the heavens. There are things happening in God's uh, holy temple that is in heaven now there, there are things taking place while in heaven while there are things taking place on earth. This first angel, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation and every kindred and tongue and people. Now, it would be real easy to say, Well, God is speaking to the Gentiles again. Well, the angel is proclaiming this message to the Gentiles that are left on the earth, to those that are, have not still died, to those that have received the mark, to those that are still left on the earth. They haven't died yet. But this is not a message of salvation. You don't see anywhere that it's recorded that anybody was saved. But God is sending out his message that he sent throughout the ages that he wants them to hear. It's not the message of grace. It's not a message of salvation. It is a message that God is almighty and it's not the gospel of the kingdom. That's what the 144,000 went preaching. This is an angel speaking from God to tell the world that I am God almighty I have done what I said. I have defeated the devil. I have taken back this earth for my glory. I have destroyed the devil. This is a message. The angel flies through heaven. And it's an everlasting gospel from God. He preaches it, but it doesn't bring forth salvation. There is no record anywhere in God's word that it ever produces one soul. But it's a message that the world has to hear because God is almighty. We've said many times through our teaching as Paul taught, as others have taught that the Christians, God's children, God's family, the house of Israel we have groaned bitterly at times for God to finish this ugly thing of sin. Well, here God has finished it. We know and we've told you many times that as we've been teaching this, our Lord, when he taught his disciples how to pray, he taught them to pray, thy kingdom come. His kingdom has come. When we are here, the devil's kingdom has been destroyed. God's kingdom is being revealed. The great inauguration of the king is about to take place. The marriage supper of the lamb for the bride of Christ with our Lord is about to take place in heaven. The message has gone out. These are things that God is proclaiming. They said with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. That's what you've got to understand. This is not an hour of salvation. This is an hour of judgment. You've got to understand it. You've got to rightly divide it. This is a time of judgment. And it has come. The, the message is to worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Everything that God made. It's time for humanity to worship God, but they don't. They still hate God. In all of these things we've been reading here in the last little bit, he said in all of this, they repented not. They don't turn to God, they still hate God. They've got marks in their forehead. They've got marks in their hands. They've already doomed 
their position with God forever and eternity. It said, and there followed another angel. Here's another angel that's flying through the heavens while this angel is bringing the everlasting gospel of God, which states that he is almighty. This other angel that flies through the heaven now, it is proclaiming that Babylon has fallen. What is Babylon? As we study here, Babylon is the world of evil that the devil owns. The world that he has taken political domination and he has been given the power of God to be able to call fire out of heaven, to do all of these miracles. He has deceived the whole world and he has fallen. The message is being declared from God on the earth that his power is gone. His kingdom has failed. There is no more power of the devil left. God's not finished yet, but it's all going to take place real fast. This angel has declared that evil has come to an end. How many of you believe that it will? Amen. God is God. It said... The great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You know, I kind of believe, and I, I'm just, uh, maybe, there's no word that either uh, supports this or takes it away. But I believe this is going to be in Rome like it was in the days of Christ. I believe with all of my heart this city is the one that was wounded. I believe this empire that we just read and studied about here just a little bit back. I believe that this is the same type of a kingdom. It may not be Rome, but I believe it is. And I believe that the scriptures will tell us as we get a little further down through this study that it's a place, uh, and I think it will acquaint itself with Rome. I think it proclaims itself as having seven hills. That's the only seven hill city in the world is the city of Rome. That is the power that existed when Christ was on the earth. That is the one that tried to kill him. That is where the Roman system started up. That's where the papacy started was out of that during the dark ages. They tried to come up with a way to worship and to replace Christ. This is all coming to a head. It says here that the great city and because she had made all the nations drink. I don't know where this power exists, but every nation is in love with whatever this is. They're in love with the, with the beast that controls everything. But he said the message that comes from God is that she has fallen. And the third angel, here comes another angel, followed them saying with a loud voice of any man worship, this is the next vision that we see He's proclaiming damnation forever to those that receive the mark of this one that they have been sworn to love and worship. He said, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup, it will be pure wrath from God. There will be no concentration. There will be no other part except it comes directly from God. And they'll be tormented from that wrath. Without mixture into the cup of indignation or the, the very uh, power of God, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Who is this? That's everybody that worshiped the beast. That's everybody that received the mark. That's all of those people that are left on the earth that have not yet died. They're praying to die. We've already been studying that where they pray God and they have these sores all over them. We have demons chasing them. They have been wounded. They are begging God to take their life. They want to die and they suffer, the Bible says, and cannot die. This is the ter terrible. Jesus said it would be this way. 
but the smoke of their torment and ascended up forever. They'll never get away from this. Where they sold out and said, we want the devil, we don't want God. We'll take the number of the beast and we'll suffer the consequences. It said the smoke of their torment and ascended up forever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Now the house of Israel is still suffering. They're still going through this. A lot of them are being martyred. We've talked to you about how that back earlier in the teaching of the Revelation, it talked about those that they needed to wait for just a little while to their brothers join them in martyrdom. This, uh, this is those. This is what happens. It says, And I heard the voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead. It'll be a blessing to be dead. Can you imagine, Brother Ernie? God is saying that to whatever humanity is left on the earth. Blessed are the dead which were able to die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And I looked and behold a white cloud. Here's another vision. There is a cloud And the one that's sitting on it is like the Son of Man. This is looking forward. This is not going to happen right here. John is only able to see the way it's going to take place. You could turn on over in the Revelation and you could see how that the Lord comes back on the clouds. He comes back with the saints. He's riding upon the white horse. He is not uh, at all a victim but he's the one that has all the power the saints of God are with him he's coming back this is a little prelude and tells us it is time God has declared it and he said uh, I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one set like unto the son of man that's Jesus having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. What is he saying? David, I know you know, and some of you other older brothers and some of you ladies, I'm sure you had to use a sickle. A sickle was an instrument of reaping or a destruction. You know what it is, Brother James. Well, this one that's riding on the cloud is Jesus. And it's come time, brother. And he's going to reap the earth. He's going to do it, and he's going to do it swiftly. It says here, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice of him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come to reap for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe it's all come to an end God has already cast the devil from his presence he's down here tormenting Israel and the rest of the, the kindreds of the world this angel is crying out for the son of God to reap it it's over it's finished it said, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle, in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. It's over. The battle is finished. Jesus finishes the battle of good and evil. He finishes the devil. He finishes all of those that hated him. It says, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came from the altar. Which had the power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle. Crying out to Jesus all the way. Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vines of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. There is something going on in heaven 
that is the final move of God to proclaim on this sin-cursed earth at this time that all the battles of evil and good are finished. The King of Kings has come to finish it all. It said the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered of the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And if you can imagine this, this next verse is going to tell us something that the world has never seen. You've never seen it. But when God finishes this thing, it's going to be one ugly thing. It said the wine press was trodden without the city. This is the battle of Armageddon. God doesn't permit it to happen in Jerusalem. It'll be north of Jerusalem in the valley of Jehoshaphat. In the valley of Megiddo, this is where this is going to take place. It says, and the blood came out of the wine press even to the horse's bridles. Can you imagine how tall a horse stands? Probably six or seven feet. That's how high this blood is going to be. It said by the space, this blood came out of God's pressing or God's reaping. Jesus doing the reaping. Jesus doing the final judgment. The blood came out to the horse's bridles. Six or seven feet deep. Can you imagine looking out down this valley and seeing a river of blood flowing about 10 or 12 miles wide? That's how wide it is in that valley. And it's 200 miles long or 600 furlongs. Brother James, can you imagine? We've never seen nothing like that. Of all the wars that have ever been fought, there's never been anywhere that the blood stood upon the earth. This battle that God is going to do through His Son with this final sickle of reaping and the angel screaming out to God and to Jesus to get it done, it's taken place. And humanity is going to die at such a massive volume and Rate that the blood will be that deep. Brother Ernie, I'd say probably a horse stands about that tall. That will be the river of blood. And it will be as wide as 10 or 12 miles wide and 200 miles long. That's something like from here maybe to Columbus, Ohio. Can you imagine the slaughter of humanity in this wrath of God, this indignation? This time of judgment, it's not a time of salvation, children. It's a time of judgment. Humanity has been given their chance to repent, and they repented not. They didn't want God. They still don't want... They've sold out to the devil. Let me tell you what I want to tell you right here. Listen to me. I'm not some big somebody that's important. I'm only a little voice for God and the great thing He's about to do. I'm one of the few today that are teaching and preaching what God is getting ready to do. I want to tell you, I think you're very blessed to be here this morning. God is going to finish what God determined. And God has given us the church to come to, to escape all of it. You can be saved. You can find the grace of God. God has not appointed you under wrath, but under salvation. He wants to save you. You can go to heaven, but you've got to turn from the world of sin. You've got to quit loving things more than you love the church. The world is so drunk, intoxicated on this power of babbling, this power of evil, this hatred towards God and the love towards the world. He said, love not the world, neither the things that are therein. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that's all against God. 
But I call on you as just an humble servant of God that has no good in me except what God gives me. I beg you to turn to God. Quit playing games with your soul. Turn to the Lord while there's still mercy. Let us stand.